Hi everyone, in this video we'll be talking about resin bonded bridges, their indications, contraindications, their design features and the clinical workflow from start to finish. So just before we get started, we'd like to thank Dr. Kushal Gardia, who is a consultant in restorative dentistry and a specialist in periodontology, prosthodontics, endodontics, restorative dentistry, and has a special interest in dental implantology. Dr. Gardia has been kind enough to provide the content from ACE courses, and while this video is just a summary, the full webinar is available to students completely free of charge on his ACE courses website. Sign up link in the description. We won't bore you by reading what you can see on the screen now, so if you would like to have a look at the advantages and disadvantages or the indications and contraindications for a resin bonded bridge, feel free to pause the video now. I also quickly wanted to mention the survival rate for resin bonded bridges are 80% at 5 and 15 years, but the most important factors were the operator's experience and the bridge design being a cantilever. So moving on to the design, there are mainly three types that you can use. A cantilever, which is a pontic from one abutment tooth. A fixed fixed bridge, which as the name describes, is attached to two abutment teeth. And finally, a hybrid, which has a resin bonded wing or a retainer on one abutment tooth and a crown or a conventional designed retainer, which sits on the other abutment tooth. So let's start with a the cantilever. These are good when you have one missing tooth and want to replace the gap. It also has a reduced risk of secondary caries as compared to fixed fixed designs. The reason for this is because if you have one winged retainer which debonds, then that's that. The bridge will just come out. And in terms of survival rates, cantilevers last about 10 years and fixed fixed bridges last about 8 years. Also, when you have a fixed fixed design, if one retainer debonds, the other wing will just keep the bridge in place and food and plaque will build up and get trapped under the debonded wing and cause secondary caries. However, a cantilever is not preferred post-orthodontic treatment because cases have been seen where the teeth adjacent to the pontic have rotated, which of course affects the aesthetics. Because of this, it might be better to either use a fixed fixed design or to use a nighttime retainer more than what the orthodontist has prescribed for you to wear. The second design we mentioned was the fixed fixed and this is the option of choice when you have a longer span and need to replace multiple teeth. For example, if you had your premolars missing in the upper arch, you could place a wing on the three and an occlusal coverage retainer on the six with the four and the five as pontics as shown on the screen right now. Again, they're also good post orthodontic treatment, but they have a higher chance of secondary caries if you get a partial debonded retainer. So now for the hybrid design that can come with a male and female component, which allows for some freedom in movement. It also benefits us in that if one retainer debonds, then you can just remove the male component remake the new pontic with a new retainer and slot it back to the crown without having to take the crown off. A fourth design that we'll quickly mention is called a spring cantilever and these are useful when the adjacent teeth to the gap that you want to replace are compromised. Before we move on to the next section, we'd really appreciate it if you guys gave this video a thumbs up. It really helps our channel grow and reach more people. Thank you. One ideal feature that you should aim to incorporate into your bridge design is maximum coverage for better bond strength. And you can do this by extending your retainer just short of the incisal edges, measly, distally, and right down only just super gingerly to allow cleansability in the area. Posteriorly, we should be doing a fixed fixed design and we should be aiming for full occlusal coverage. The reason is because when you do partial occlusal coverage, the occlusal forces in lateral excursion can cause the retainer to shear off. Another ideal feature is to ask for the retainer to be a minimum of 0.7 millimeters thick to prevent the warping of the retainer. The design should ensure that it is cleansable, which means the patient should be able to feed some super floss underneath the pontic. And in terms of occlusion, we want to have a holding contact on the pontic, which means they do contact an ICP or you want to avoid all protrusive or lateral excursive contacts. You may have come across cases where an opposing tooth has over erupted. This is why it's important to check the occlusion. How could we create space in this area? The options are to use the DAL approach, orthodontic intrusion, enamelplasty, or a combination of these together to create the space needed to restore the missing space. You also want to look at the abutment teeth and check them both radiographically with a periapical radiograph and clinically with sensibility testing. You also need to consider the patient's lip line at rest and when they smile, and if the case is post-orthodontics. And finally, for abutment selection, which tooth would you cantilever from? Let's say you're replacing an upper lateral incisor, would you use the central incisor or the canine? The answer is, 
If both are not compromised in any way, you would choose the one with more enamel surface area to bond to. Although this is less important, you should also be considering the wraparound from mesial to distal of the tooth. In this case, of course, the canine would have more wraparound. But if the central incisor had a larger enamel surface area to bond to, you would use this instead. Make sure to be cautious of the metal retainer showing through the incisor. To prevent this, make the incisal edge of the retainer just short of the incisal edge of the tooth so that we don't compromise the aesthetics. We can also use an opaque cement like Panavia to block out the color of the metal wing. The evidence by King et al 2015 leans towards not preparing teeth at all and says that, that there is little benefit in doing so. Tooth preparation is irreversible and so should be avoided in the name of minimally invasive dentistry. It's justifiable if you need to make mesial and or distal guide planes so that you can have a path of insertion for the retainer. Some people prepare a margin, but the enamel is thin and removing it may very easily expose dentine, reducing the bond strength massively. It would be better to stick the retainer in high by adding 0.7 millimeters of thickness than to remove tooth tissue. The surrounding teeth will very quickly adapt to this new occlusal height by dialing in. This is a case example of this happening. You can see in this photo that the canines are in contact, and so adding the 0.7 millimeter retainer will open up the bite. You can see this on the study cast here, and then six months later when the occlusion was reassessed, the posterior teeth have dialed in and closed the posterior separation. One example of when you should prepare a tooth is if it had an old restoration. Let's say you wanted to replace a gap in the upper left five by using the upper left four and the upper left six as fixed fixed abutment teeth. And let's say the upper left six had a class two mesial occlusal restoration. You should replace the restoration with another composite to ensure that there isn't secondary caries happening underneath and then you want to create a mesial rest seat, like you would for a partial denture. This would increase the rigidity of the connection between the retainer and the pontic by increasing the thickness of the metal in that area. This will also allow more favorable bonding to the resin cement and enhance the retention of the bridge. Something else to consider is the preparation of the pontic site with electrosurgery or a dry high-speed burr when there is excessive gingiva in the area. You can draw an imaginary line between the gingival margin of the central incisor and the canine, and the gingival margin of this pontic should be one millimeter below this imaginary line. If this excess tissue isn't removed, the pontic would look really small and you won't have the most aesthetic result. The alternative is to do a ridge lap design, but these would be really difficult to clean for the patient, which is also not ideal. When taking your impression, ideally you should take both your working impression and the opposing impression in light and medium medium bodied silicone. You will rarely need to use retraction cord palatally or lingually to expose the maximum area of enamel. And when you're doing anterior work or multiple units posteriorly, then you should be using a face bow. You can also use an intraoral scanner. And the benefit of this is that you can send the image to the lab and keep your articulating paper marks present to demonstrate where the patient is occluding. You want to send the lab a set of instructions in the prescription and they are as follows. Please construct a cantilevered RBB replacing the upper right three from the upper right four using nickel chromium alloy. Full occlusal coverage with metal covering, all occlusal, mesial and palatal surfaces. Minimum thickness of the wing equal to 0.7 millimeters. Bridge will be cemented in high, thick connectors with a minimum height of three millimeters. Modified ridge lap pontic. Please sandblast fitting surface. Pontic to have a light shim stock hold on ICP. Pontic to have no contact in lateral excursive mandibular movements. And you also need to send them the shade that you want the pontic to be. Now, when you come into the appointment and you want to try in the bridge, you can do this using non eugenol temp bond and you can check the fit of the retainer, the occlusion and the aesthetics. If any adjustments need to be made, now is the time to make them. Once you're happy with the try in, you want to bond it in and we need to consider three things the resin bonded bridge retainer, the tooth itself, and the cement we'll use. So starting with the RRB retainer, we want to sandblast the wing immediately before cementation with 50 microns of alumina to increase the surface area and micro-mechanical retention. Then you need to steam clean it to remove any alumina or metal deposits, or you could alternatively etch with phosphoric acid for 20 seconds and wash it off. Finally, you need to apply a metal primer for bonding and make sure you don't cure it. On the tooth itself, we need a rubber dam with floss ligatures for moisture control. Then you use a polishing disc to clean any debris before sandblasting, etching, and rinsing with water. Then you need to follow the bonding protocol of the cement you'd like to use. As for the cement itself, you could use a dual cured resin cement like Panavia or Variolink, but there are loads to choose from. Once bonded in, you want to check the occlusion, clear excess cement, 
teach the patient how to clean under the bridge and between the retainer and the pontix. Then you should review the patient and use an ultrasonic or burr to remove any more excess cement and make sure the dial is working. If they had orthodontic treatment, you would provide new retainers once their teeth have dialed in and ensure they have regular visits to ensure continued periodontal stability if needed. Okay guys, we hope you found that video useful and if you did, we'd really appreciate it if you liked the video and subscribed to our channel if you haven't subscribed already. There are more videos like this coming soon in line with the ACE Courses webinars created by Dr. Gardia. For the full webinar, make sure you check out the ACE Courses website which is completely free for students to use and contains really interesting cases which for time purposes we couldn't include in this video. There's a link in the description for you to sign up if you haven't done so already. Thank you guys for watching and we'll see you in the next video.